Good morning, uh, everyone. Welcome to our online service uh, for Macaulay and Catesbridge Presbyterian Churches. If this is your first time uh, tuning in or you regularly tune in, we're so pleased that you have. Uh, we really hope that you're encouraged by the good news of Jesus that you hear throughout our online service today. We hope that you're really blessed. Uh, if you don't know me, my name's Stuart. I'm a, an applicant for the ministry in our denomination, so I'll be taking uh, all of our service uh, today. Just before we carry on, there's a few announcements of things going on in the life of the church at the moment. Uh, first, you'll see there um, our midweek meeting for this incoming week um, will be posted on the church Facebook page and on the Macarelli YouTube channel. That'll be before eight o'clock in the evening um, on Wednesday. Um, we'll be hearing a little bit uh, about the international mission to Jewish people. So that'll be really good for you to tune into. Um, that'll be followed uh, by a slightly later than usual Zoom time um, of prayer at 8.45 uh, p.m. So it'd be really, really good if you could tune into that. If you want to uh, get the link for that, there is Nigel's email address, our minister here, and he will uh, fire that relevant link to you um, if you would be pleased to join in on that. Last announcement is that, as per usual, next Sunday's worship service will be posted on the church Facebook page and in the Macarelli YouTube channel page um, next Sunday morning. God uh, calls us to worship, calls us to come into his presence and enjoy him with gratitude and also carrying our really real needs and our longings um, with us. Uh, and he does that through these words from Isaiah. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, Come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. The Lord loves to satisfy us with himself because he's the one that we're made for. So we're going to begin our, our time worshiping this morning with a hymn that helps us to lift our eyes to Jesus for just that. So let's get ready to sing in whatever way is most comfortable for you, wherever you are.
Jesus, we turn our eyes to you. We're now going to continue and worship together uh, by praying, by coming before the Lord in prayer. God in his word has said to us uh, that we should approach him in prayer um, and his throne of grace with confidence so that we receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We do not need to be timid when coming to our kind heavenly father. So let's come to him together now in prayer. Almighty God, Many of us have come before you once and confessed to you that we're sinners and ask that you would forgive us and cleanse us of all our sins through your blessed son, Jesus Christ. You heard and you answered us and we were ransomed and healed and forgiven. And since that time we have needed every day as again today to confess the sins of our lives to you. We sometimes, through the voice of the devil, grew weary of coming to you to confess those same routine sin sins day after day. Our ego, our prayerlessness, our lust, our greed, being discontented, being lukewarm, failing to love you or love our neighbors as ourselves. But this morning, we have to do the same. We confess those sins to you, and we pray that you will help us never to grow weary of confessing those same sins to you, and never to doubt that your mercy is greater than all the sins that we commit throughout our lives. Thank you, Father, that in Christ you are a welcoming God who invites all who are weary and heavy laden in their spirit to come to you. Thank you for being so willing and ready to receive your enemies and to bless them with rest. We are just those kind of people, Lord. Welcome us again into your presence and your rest today, wherever we're tuning in. We confess that we drift again and again into trying to work ourselves into your good books, trying to justify ourselves before you. We're not wholly and confidently relying on the finished work of Jesus for our right standing before you. Lord Jesus, help us to grasp your grasp of us. We are kept by you and we are kept for you. Nothing can pull us from your hand nor tear us from your heart, Jesus. Many times this seems too good to be true or we doubt it, but it's all we need to get through the challenges that we face each day. Therefore, please, Lord, increase our faith help our unbelief to die so that we can live aware of those amazing spiritual riches you've blessed us with in the heavenly places. Indeed, Holy Spirit, bring from that throne of grace into our hearts and lives an abundance of mercy, for we are foolish people. Bring peace, for we're a broken people. Bring love, for we are a selfish people. Be truly praised in our hearts on this Lord's Day and every day this week in each of our lives. We pray all this only through the name of Jesus, our representative who is before you right now and whose in name we pray. Amen. Well, kids, uh, over the last few weeks, we have been beginning a new uh, series in which we've been looking at a new catechism that we've been studying together. It's called the New City Catechism, and hopefully you should see it on your screen there now. There's a free app for it, which we've, we've tried to plug each week. Um, it's really, really excellent, and we'd really commend that to you. It's been helping us uh, to think through uh, some of the really big questions in life and about God and the important answers um, that are there in the Bible for us uh, to those questions. This morning, we're going to be learning uh, question and answer number four, and that is, how and why did God create us? A couple of weeks ago, we learned that God is the creator of everything and everyone. So now it's natural for us to wonder, Why? Why did he make everything and everyone? Because God didn't actually need to make everything or everyone. He wasn't bored or unhappy 
before creation. Remember last week, we learned that God is the Holy Trinity. God is three in one. So God has never, ever been lonely. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, one God, he has been uh, forever in perfect company with himself. He has been perfectly happy forever. So he didn't need to make you or to make me or to make anything else. He doesn't need us to do anything for him. He's the one who gives everything to us from right from the moment we're made all the way into eternity. He gives everything to us. So why did God decide, I'm going to make a universe and I'm going to fill one particular planet with a whole bunch of human beings? Well, God tells us right in the first couple of pages of the Bible, this is what God says to us. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Boys and girls, some say that we don't have a purpose. There's a theory, which a lot of people teach as if it was fact, but it's really not, that we're just a bunch of cells that have come together by chance, and that means that our lives have no meaning, uh, that we don't really have a purpose for our existence. But we know in our hearts that that's not true. That's not the case. We all live our lives, every single person who's ever lived, as if our life is full of meaning. We just need to rediscover what that meaning is because for centuries and centuries and centuries, human beings have been running away from that meaning that we were made with, that purpose that we were made with. God says in those verses that we've just read that he's created every single one of us. He's made every human who's ever lived. He's made boys to be boys. He's made girls to be girls. And he's made us with those obvious differences between us. But every single human who's ever been created by God has at least one thing in common. And that is that they have been made in the image of God. Here's what that means. Whenever a king in ancient times um, had a, a kingdom so big that he knew he was never going to go to the other side of it. He was never going, going to go to the other side and actually see the people that were his subjects in his kingdom. What he would do is he would build a massive statue for himself, kind of like these. He would build a massive statue for himself in, in a big public place so that everyone in the city, everyone in the area would be able to see, oh, this is who rules over me. This is the person who's in charge. This is who I belong to. That's what it means to be made in the image of God. We're not statues, of course. We're far better than that. But God has made us to be like little statues, filling his creation, representing him to each other and to everything else that he's made. That's how significant and that's how meaningful God has made every single one of us. He's put his image onto us. And that means that everything we, we say or everything that we think or everything that we do has massive consequences because it's representing God. So our lives are jam-packed, full of meaning and purpose. So that's the first thing that we learn from those verses about why God made us. It's to represent him to the world, to show off how good he is, to show off how good he is and how glorious he is to everyone and to everything. But there is a second thing in those verses that God tells us he made us for as well. And that is uh, there in, those, in that verse, um, chapter one on verse 26 of Genesis. God says, let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. God gave us the responsibility of ruling over all the earth and all the creatures in it. 
He wants us to be a good ruler like him. He wants us to be like him as the king of this universe. He wants us to care for everything just the same way that he would. And that gives our lives a whole lot of meaning, a whole lot of responsibility, a whole lot of purpose. And that's every single one of us. No one misses out on this. That's exactly what God has made you for. So let's take a full look at our question and answer from our catechism today. So say it out loud with me. Um, And remember, you can come back to this uh, throughout the day and just rewind the video and watch this um, so that you can try and memorize it forever. How and why did God create us? Here's the long answer. God created us male and female in his own image to know him, love him, live with him, and glorify him. And it is right that we who were created by God should live to his glory. You should go back um, today and tomorrow and throughout the rest of the week before we study next week's one to try and remember that answer. Get it into your memory so that you know it off by heart. But if you can't do that longer answer, there is a shorter answer which helps us as well. And that is that God created us male and female in his own image to glorify him. Let me pray for us now, boys and girls, wherever we are at home, um, and I'll pray for us about that. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have made us with so much meaning and so much purpose. We pray that we would feel that so that we never feel unimportant. And we pray you would help us to live the way you want us to, representing you to each other, to other human beings, and to the rest of the world. In Jesus' name. Amen. Boys and girls, we're now going to sing a a song which will help us to remember everything that we've just learned uh, about God um, and help us to express how grateful we are to him for making us um, with lives filled with so much meaning and purpose. So let's sing this song together. Well, if you haven't got a a Bible handy, now would be a really good time to grab that because we're going to move now to the most important part of the service, which is hearing God's word read aloud to us. Um, So we're going to be reading today John chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Uh, You can pause me if you don't have that Bible uh, handy, but it'd be really helpful if you were to grab that now as we read God's word together. John chapter 2, starting at verse 1 and reading all the way through to verse 12. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, 
fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples and they stayed there for a few days. Amen. This is God's word to us and we ask that he would bless it to us. Before we uh, unpack that passage, let's uh, take time to pray in our prayer of intercession together. Let's pray for um, ourselves as a church family and for the community around us and the world at large. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you heal the brokenhearted. You bind up their wounds. You love to do that. So we pray that you would do that again in an obvious way for those people who are um, within our church family who are ill, grieving, or suffering in some way, Lord. Please grant your, your peace and your confidence to those who are in such situations. We especially want to remember in prayer this morning the, the family and friends of Dorothy Montgomery because of their loss. Father, we thank you that she knew you. We do ask that you would grant the healing of the broken hearts of the people who are left behind who were in her life. Grant clarity in the confusion of grief. Grant the hope that comes in knowing your son. We take now a, a moment of silence at home to pray for those that we know um, that are in need in this way. Father, we're eager for your blessing on your word in the life of our church families, but we especially pray this morning for the teenagers in our churches. We thank you for the commitment of Emily and Emma to serving them, and we ask that by your grace and through your spirit, Lord, you would bring the fruit of faith in the lives of each young person. Cause them to see your glory in the gospel and help them to feel their need of you more and more cause them to abide in your love and bring, we ask, many, many, many more young people into your church. Cause them to come looking um, for something that will give them a hope and a satisfaction and a certainty that doesn't exist in the world, Lord. Only you can give that. We pray you would bring many young people to start turning to you in this area. We ask for the same as Easter approaches, Heavenly Father. Usually, uh, such a unique opportunity to share your good news um, has been taken from us in its usual way. We know creativity is needed with these ever-changing restrictions and still unusual times. Grant that creativity and evangelism, Lord. Bless Nigel and all our elders with ideas for opportunities and boldness and how to tell many people this Easter about the hope that we have in the resurrection of your son and equip our church families to be doing that work of ministry ourselves. Father, as we adjust to the news of further extensions to the lockdown, we pray especially for those who right now feel they've had their fill of loneliness and isolation in our church families and in the wider community. While we can't gather together in person, we ask that you give to all those in special need of it, the companionship, that they need. We pray for deepening friendships and growth in loving our neighbor during this lockdown, Lord, and for that developing thoughtfulness in each of us to shine as a witness for you. We're also conscious that so many businesses and employment situations are at a breaking point. You can provide 
more than we can ask or imagine, Father. So we ask for you to meet the needs of our communities. You are the one with the willingness and the ability and the wisdom to give us what is best for us. So we leave our needs and the needs of those we know in your hands. We're also grieved, Father, yet not enough over these latest reminders of the enforced changes to the law of our land, which make it legal for the nation's children to be killed. Father, you make the hearts of our nation's leaders turn wherever you will. You are the one who is sovereign. You have told us, Lord, that the way in which our land treats its children reveals its spiritual state. So we need you to show great mercy, Father. Please cause our land to cherish life as you do. Please work that into us through repentance and faith in your Son. Help your people to die to self in order to show costly love to mothers in crisis pregnancies. And lastly, Sovereign Lord, we pray now as well as on Wednesday evening that you will keep blessing the efforts of the International Mission to Jews. Father, we thank you that you are saving Jews. We thank you that you're so gracious that you have not totally forsaken the Near East despite long-standing rejection of the gospel. Father, Jesus said to the woman at the well that salvation comes from the Jews. We pray that they would at last in great numbers begin to recognize their Lord again. We thank you for the great love of the team at IMJ for Jewish people around the world and those communities and their creativity to keep reaching them with the gospel even during the pandemic. May you grant that same love and concern for souls of men and women to each of us as we hear more of their example on Wednesday evening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, folks, uh, if you would like to grab those Bibles again, um, we're going to be uh, unpacking that passage that we've just read, John chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 12. Um, you can pause me if you need to. I really would encourage you to grab that Bible because it's so important to have that out in front of you. It is more important than anything that I've got to say about this passage. While you're grabbing that, let me just uh, talk to you about some of, uh, well, a recurring theme in the, uh, the favorite stories in my life, and I, I hope the stories that you love um, as well. A recurring theme in the stories that I love is that the universe needs to be renewed. The whole universe needs to be wiped clean, needs to be fixed up. It needs the presence of whatever evil and suffering and sadness there happens to be in those make-believe worlds. It needs those gone. So take, for example, um, and I've been warned to give you a, a spoiler alert. So if you're into the, the Marvel movies, the Avengers movies, and you've not, uh, for some reason, seen the ones that have been out for a couple of years, the latest ones, I'd encourage you to mute me for, for 30 seconds. Um, but you should have seen them by now if you're a big fan. Um, the Marvel movies are the, the biggest movie franchise in the world. And there's about 100 of them, and they're all interconnected. And they paint a picture of a universe uh, which is marred with this evil. It's totally disintegrated because of the presence of evil and constant warfare uh, with that evil. And lo and behold, it falls, again, spoilers, to, to one figure. It falls to one figure with immense power to pay the price for the renewal of that whole universe, to make it the way that we and, as viewers and all the characters knew that it should be. Peace satisfaction and joy. It's the same in proper classic stories like C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. Now, these have been out since, what, the 50s? So you definitely shouldn't have a, a problem with a spoiler here at this point. Um, Lewis is especially outstanding, this theme of the renewal of the universe. You guys all know that really famous line from the, li line from the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Uh, Always winter but never Christmas. The villain in this, in, in this book, uh, the White Witch, she's got this whole land of Narnia under her evil magic, um, which has made the beauty of different seasons, the ordinary joys of life, just next to totally dry up. The land is covered under snow and thick layers of ice. Things barely grew. It's hard to survive. It was a permanent winter, but it never arrived at the point when they could celebrate 
or have the joy that Christmas affords. The joy of spring, that never came either. The white witch, she would kill you if you tried to have a party. It was that miserable. She was a domineering killjoy. And she was totally opposed to what makes life actually life. And again, all the hopes of all the inhabitants of that land fall to one person, Aslan. And eventually he comes along and he starts to undo all that evil. He renews the whole land. He begins to make it new again. He restores it to the fullness of life. The snow, it melts away. Merriment kicks off again. Spring comes, things start to grow. And there's joy and there's gladness and there's color again. There's a reason that that kind of plot is really attractive to us, or at least I hope really attractive to all of us. We recognize whatever we believe, whatever we come from, that this universe just isn't the way it should be. That's why we all go looking for uh, answers and solutions uh, to that question. We all go go looking um, through our beliefs or through our lifestyles for solutions to that problem to find a way around the problem of sadness and dissatisfaction and suffering in this universe so that we feel like that we've got some hope of things being the way that they should be. The businessman or the businesswoman uh, who gives up everything else for success, the student who throws themselves into a licentious lifestyle, and the monk that commits his whole life to a monastery so that he can uh, achieve nirvana, achieve this sense of of bliss by escaping the universe through his mind so that he finally gets rid of the pain of suffering. We uh, can look at all those different paths, but they have the same goal in mind, to escape this universe, which just isn't the way that it should be. Because life is filled with sadness, it's filled with emptiness and suffering. Things that used to satisfy our hearts or to get us going, they now barely feature on our radar. There's barely a blip inside of us. That's always the pattern. It's always best at first, and then it's a downhill trajectory after that. Everything loses its sparkle and its brilliance eventually, and that stings. We all feel that sting at some point in our lives. The solution in those Marvel stories, or the Chronicles of Narnia, and the renewal of the whole universe, That might seem a bit far-fetched for you, but they didn't come up with that idea. They're actually borrowing from Christianity when they talk about those things, those things, uh, those ideas which grab our attention and which make us love those stories. That is borrowed from the Bible. The Bible talks about us needing a renewal project which is literally the size of the entire universe. And that is what our passage today, John chapter two, verses 1 to 12, is all about. It's all about Jesus being the long-awaited Messiah who's bringing in his new age of super abundance and gladness by his divine renewing power. Jesus is the one who, in reality, all of human history, the whole universe, the whole Old Testament is pointing forward to, the one who we've been waiting for, the one who's going to arrive and begin to make all things new. As Jesus later puts it in John's gospel, his purpose is that he came to give us life abundantly, life to the full. The scene's an unusual one for Jesus uh, to choose for his first miracle, isn't it? There's John uh, saying that it's its first sign. And that's just John's way of saying to us that miracles are actually pointing to a much deeper reality than just themselves. They are pointing beyond the miracle in and of itself. And that's really saying something when you consider the sheer magnitude of those miracles in and of themselves. Those are phenomenal, amazing events that we read about in in the gospels, these miracles. But they're pointing to a much deeper reality. They point to the identity of Jesus and his mission. So why did Jesus choose to perform his first miracle at a wedding? And even at that, why did he not do it in front of the guests whenever he's gathered everyone around him? Why did he do it in the background? Why did he do it in front of the servants and his mother and these new disciples that he's got? Why did he choose 
water into wine, turning water into wine, as his first supernatural demonstration of a deeper reality. Well, the context that John gives us goes some way to explaining it, and it gives us the first point that we need to take to heart this morning, and that is that Jesus is the God of creation and the new creation. Jesus is the God of creation and the new creation. The first chapter chapter of John has, broadly speaking, divided into two sections. It's got two significant sections which focus on two different things. The first is the most incredible narrative talking about one particular figure, a figure called the Word. Now, you can pause me and you can go and read uh, John chapter 1 if you really want to right now to see that. It is the most gorgeous narrative that you can read. But this figure, the Word, is demonstrated in John chapter 1 as being the one who was with God in the beginning, before everything was created, before time itself started. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And there is nothing in this entire universe that has been made except through Him. He has made everything. It was made by Him. It was made for Him. This section is intentionally trying to throw our minds back to Genesis chapter 1 in the creation narratives. It even begins with the words, in the beginning, just like Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. So God, John is trying to throw our minds back to Genesis. The second section of John chapter 1, it majors on the first week of Jesus' public ministry. It's six days of activity, followed by a Sabbath and a wedding. Now that should remind you of another time in the Bible when there's six days of activity and a Sabbath quickly followed by a wedding. It's actually the first wedding in human history. It's Adam and Eve. So John is again trying to throw our mind back to the Genesis chapter one narrative about the creation of the world. And why is he doing that? He's trying to tell us something absolutely monumental. He's trying to tell us that the new creation is here. The time that the whole Old Testament was pointing forward to, the age of the Messiah, the golden age of the Messiah, the new covenant, it's finally here, the beginning of the total renewal of the whole universe. And that's actually going to end, if you follow the storyline the whole way through the Bible, of this renewal of the universe. It leaves us in the very last chapter, uh, in the very last book of the Bible, where it talks about the wedding, the wedding party of the Lamb of God. The new heavens and the new earth will finally be brought to completion and there will be a wedding party in Revelation chapter 19. The story of God working in this universe takes place between two weddings, at the start of the Bible and at the end of the Bible. And in the middle, to mark the moment when God starts accelerating toward that final grand wedding, that wonderful feast that's waiting for God's people, Jesus shows us his first sign at a little wedding in Cana in Galilee. When I was reading John chapter 1 and 2 uh, over the past couple of weeks, I was uh, a bit startled by how John chapter 1 ends and then how John chapter 2 begins with the passage we've read. If you just flick back to John chapter 1 and verse 51 in your own Bible, you'll see that it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That's Jesus saying to his disciples, you're going to see heaven and earth itself bridged, and you're going to see it bridged by me. That is an absolutely, insanely high standard to set yourself at the beginning of your work. You'll possibly remember, like I do, because I'm getting a bit older now, uh, when Jose Mourinho first arrived uh, into English football. Uh, when he did, he had his first press conference as Chelsea manager, and it became notorious. It's really famous uh, because in that press conference, he set the bar insanely high for himself. He called himself the special one. It's an iconic moment, and the fellow's done really well, don't get me wrong. He's been one of the most successful managers in all of football history. But to call himself the special one, that was really 
setting the bar too high. He's not even in the top two managers um, of the top flight of English football right now, let alone in Europe or even in all of human history. He set the bar too high. Spurs fans now feel uh, the sting of that. Jesus set the bar infinitely higher. But then he, pres- he responds to that insanely high statement, that high bar that he sets himself. He responds to it by taking his new disciples to a wedding. He responds to a wedding invite from a close friend or a relative. The disciples must have felt a little underwhelmed or confused. I was a little confused. Uh, a wedding, yep, it's a great thing in normal life, but it's not as grand as bridging heaven and earth itself. But Jesus is doing, uh, in the first of his signs, doing it at a wedding, at the end of his first seven days of ministry, what he's doing is he's showing us that he is the infinite glad God who began human history by his own power. And he gave the gladness of a wedding back then at the beginning of creation, at the beginning of human history. And even though we humans have since taken that wonderful universe and thrown it into a spiral of sin and darkness and suffering and sadness, he has not turned his back on us. He has pursued us to the point of taking on human flesh, calling the disciples to himself and demonstrating to them and to us that he's the God who's going to make all things new into just the way that we need them so that we can have life to the full. That's his identity. That's his mission. So that's our first point to take to heart from the scriptures this morning. Jesus is the God of creation. He's the God of the new creation. Now, let's start to dig down a little bit into the the details of the passage itself. Before I start talking to you about wine, I've got a confession to make. I actually don't like wine at all. So it's a bit hard for me to sit and talk to you about the quality of wine. I did try it once. I tried apparently some really, really fine wine. I was at a friend's house uh, from Bible college. He brought a bunch of former students over and he gave us some Australian wine. I don't understand anything beyond that the origin's significant, so I can't tell you any details. Um, but I can tell you I wasn't a fan at all. And I, I'm so put off after that little sip that I had that I've not touched it since and never plan to. Back in ancient Israel, however, I imagine there weren't many people like me. Um, Wine was a major part of life for these people, had been for thousands and thousands of years. Um, Here is just a taste, okay? Here is just a taste of how significant wine was in the Middle Eastern minds, in the Near Eastern minds thousands of years ago. A common saying amongst rabbis, Israel's teachers at the time, was that without wine, there is no joy. Now, there's far more to that statement um, than what you think um, and to that attitude, and we're going to see that in just a second. But it's worth slowing down for a second and uh, letting me tell you that we're not, the Bible is not saying that Jewish culture, or even that the scriptures themselves, encourage uh, overindulgence in wine. God has made perfectly clear um, in his word what he thinks about the abuse of his good gifts that he gives to us. And their wine was nowhere near as strong as ours is today. For more on that, you can check out 1 Corinthians or even just uh, check out this brief verse from Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18, where it says, do not get drunk with wine. So it's very explicit. For that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Scripture, though, is also really, really clear that wine isn't wicked. Wine is, that, that would be a direct contradiction of God's word. Again, we'll see that very shortly and we'll, we'll zoom in on that in a bit more detail. For now, let's grab our Bibles again and read verses one to five of our passage in John chapter two, verses one to five. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. 
The second point that we're being taught here uh, from God's word this morning is that we all need wine. Now, you might be really confused by that, um, given what I've just said, um, that I don't even like wine, but I just want to give you a memorable way um, of retaining in your long-term memory what the scriptures are actually trying to teach us here. The rabbis 2,000 years ago in Israel said, without wine, there is no joy. Here's a sense from the Bible, uh, from Psalm 104, of what they're actually getting at in that statement. Psalm 104, verses 14 and 15 say, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. The Old Testament continually associates wine with human gladness. It symbolizes human joy, the God-given gift of joy to his people. So another way of putting our second point is that we all need God-given gladness. You can see how a wedding without wine uh, back then would have been a major problem if that's how highly they thought of wine. Weddings were the high point in community life back then. This was the thing that you looked forward to in societal, societal life, uh, especially if you weren't wealthy. This was the high point of your own life, an occasion of joy, an occasion of gladness when you were essentially actually treated as royalty. The, the bride and the groom were treated as a, like a, a little king and queen. They even had little crowns and they wore like royal robes. There was no long flowing wedding dress or a tux. It was almost like you were royalty. The wedding party would have lasted for a full week. Instead of jetting off to a honeymoon, they would have held what was basically an open house for the whole community to come gathering in to be able to share in their gladness. It was a huge moment in the life, uh, the community life of Israel. So wine, of course, was essential. And it was incredibly embarrassing if the groom couldn't supply enough to match the demand. There's actually a few reports um, from history that if you, as the groom, weren't able to provide enough wine for your, your own wedding, the bride's family would open a lawsuit against you. They would pursue legal action against their own new son-in-law. So this is embarrassing stuff for our nameless groom. And that, that embarrassment is what prompts Mary into action in our passage. It's likely that this wedding involved people close to Mary and to Jesus. You know, it was possibly a relative or at least a, a close family friend. That's why they were invited. It's also possible that Mary was doubling up as some kind of organizer, a helper at the, the wedding party. That's why she had some authority to be able to say to the servants in verse five, do whatever he tells you. Either way, she's being motivated inside by a, a desire to prevent the embarrassment of someone that she cares for. She gets a really surprising response from Jesus. Don't worry, we'll look at that properly at the end of the sermon. For now, let's just focus in on Jesus's perspective and how that differed from Mary's. He cared about the embarrassment of this friend or relative because God genuinely, graciously cares for the things that we would expect him to just pass over as irrelevant, too small, too dumb to pay attention to. God does not do that. He cares for the needs that we have, even those that come from our own deficiencies, our own shortcomings, our own mistakes. That is good news. He cares about the fact even that we're embarrassed by them. He demonstrate that, demonstrates that through this miracle, his kind, attentive, super abundant provision for needy people. He redeems us from our shortcomings all through his fullness. But the primary thing that Jesus is looking at is not our, the embarrassment of this man. He sees something much deeper when Mary raises this wine shortage with him. He is spotting in his father's providence something far more significant going on. Jesus uh, knew, now that he's a week into his uh, public ministry, he knew full well that every single one of his miracles, his signs were specifically planned in eternity past 
by his heavenly Father. There was no just willy-nilly, doing a miracle here, doing a miracle there. Everything was planned very specifically, and he knew it, and he wanted to live according to the will of his Father in heaven. That's what he's getting at in verse 4. If you look down at verse 4 in your Bible, when it says, my hour has not yet come. His mind, even though he's surrounded by all this joy, is being drawn forward three years to the moment when he knows that he's going to pay the ransom price to to renew all things. He is going to pay the ransom price for renewing humanity and the whole universe. He is already thinking of the infinite sadness and suffering that he's gonna have to endure so that we don't have to, so that he can give us the gladness that he wants for us. The Old Testament had definitively ended now with John the Baptist in John chapter one. It slammed shut like the the transfer window, you know, and the new golden age of the Messiah had been ushered in. Jesus is fully aware of that. And as he hears of this wine shortage, he sees how it points to the deeper reality of Israel's spiritual condition. A lack of wine a lack of gladness in God, no spiritual vitality, no abundance, no sweet taste in communion with God. They had lost their joy. They should have been at their peak because their God has now finally come down to them in flesh, in the person of Jesus. But there was so little. And that's the same for everyone. Even today, if we don't know Jesus, Jesus is the one who gives gladness in God. He is the one who's come to make all things new, starting with the hearts of people by making us alive to God. He gives us new spiritual taste buds so that we can, as the psalmist puts it, taste and see that the Lord is good. Israel had been on a a downward trajectory spiritually for a while, and we're going to see shortly from the passage one of the reasons as to why that is. But fundamentally, It was because they had failed to see the glory of their God. The word glory, it comes up in verse 11, if you glance down at verse 11. Without that taste for God's glory, they'd fallen into a spiritual wasteland. They drifted from following God and their spiritual thirst was deadly. Our spiritual thirst is deadly. We need to measure ourselves by this yardstick for a second. I don't like it either. I don't find it very pleasant to do that kind of um, self-reflection, but it's important that we do it together. That's why we gather for church. Do we have the gladness individually and corporately that God gives to his people? I didn't enjoy answering that question when I was preparing this. I am quicker to be joyful over other things, unimportant things in comparison to being joyful in God. How about if you're not a Christian and you're hearing this? If you are a not, not a Christian and you're, you're watching this and you've reached this point, I'm so impressed. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in. We're so glad uh, that you are. We really hope you're blessed by what you hear today. We want God to bless you and we love you as a church family. But let me ask you, have you not already noticed in your life how even the best things lose their quality and lose their luster. The best things that we love, eventually they're just, they're not even a blip on our radar. It's a downhill trajectory after that first taste. Just like in verse 10 here, when the master of the feast goes to the bridegroom and says, everyone serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. As I said a few minutes ago, That's the pattern of every life on this planet, regardless of belief, regardless of lifestyle. You can be incredibly moral and religious in your efforts to look for that deep down spiritual satisfaction. You can be driven and successful and through the idea of even having a family to the side in pursuit of wealth and success and achievement for that satisfaction. Or you can say, I don't give two hoots. I will do whatever I please, whenever I please. You can opt for a licentious lifestyle like that, but you will know, you do know, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. 
Some of us can fool ourselves for a bit longer than others, but eventually we all come to realize that this just isn't what it used to be. We don't feel satisfied. We need something else. Some people go bitter. Others just kind of knuckle down and grin and bear it. Um, others have the resources or the opportunity to just keep trying to add little pleasures here and there to try and keep the thirst uh, at bay, the sharpness of that thirst. But none of it works. You know what I'm talking about. You don't need examples. But here's one worked out example that I've seen someone else describe recently in the past week or so. Pornography. The vast majority of people now have used or do use pornography. It's widely embraced in our culture. I saw a guy over the past week illustrate recently how he felt as a 12-year-old discovering it and how he just started to run after it more and more and more for that satisfaction that he first had. And now, as a 23-year-old, 11 years later, he's addicted and he knows that, that that exact thing that he used to run to that thrilled him before, it has always been diminishing in its returns. But what it was asking of him was only ever going up. It was asking more and more and more of him, but giving less and less and less back. It has battered him, the cost of that has battered him. It doesn't satisfy him anymore. And not only that, but actually being sexually involved with a loved one, like, you know, on his wedding bed, if he gets married, he knows that that's destroyed. It doesn't satisfy him anymore. Sexual pleasure has gone out the window for this man. One of God's great gifts to humans, and it's gone for him. The joy of a wedding night is more beyond recognition because pornography is not meant to bear the weight of expectation that our world now puts on it and so many other things like it for satisfaction. The costs just keep going up and up and the returns are forever diminishing. That is the functional definition of what the Bible calls idolatry. It's so relevant, it's not an outdated word. The cost's always going up as we put more and more of our expectation on something to give us satisfaction, to give us hope, when it's only God who can take the weight of that expectation, who can actually provide the satisfaction that we are looking for. We all need gladness. We all need satisfaction. That is what makes life, life. That is what makes it worth living. We all need, in other words, wine, the wine of God, and who gives that wine? Who can slake our deep thirst? Jesus. Jesus is the one who gives us the gladness that we need. Read uh, verses 6 to 12 with me again. Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Jesus produces 180 gallons of wine out of water. That should astonish us. That should absolutely stagger us. That is not just an incredibly generous wedding gift for this couple. This is what he will give to anyone who comes to him when they hear that he will give what he later says is life to the full, life abundantly. With Jesus, the best doesn't come first. It just keeps getting better forever into eternity. It is an upward trajectory with Jesus into his new creation where he is going to satisfy every longing that we've got and wipe clean, erase every sadness that we've ever felt. 
That's what Jesus achieved when his R, verse 4, actually finally came. He secured in his death, in his resurrection, and in his ascension for people who don't deserve it, satisfaction in a good God forever. And it is not a mediocre amount of satisfaction. It is not as if it's just a little bit better than everything else that the world has to offer. It is super abundant delight in God. 180 gallons shows us that God is the most generous, joyful, glad giver in the universe. He is not the one who's holding out on us in our gladness problem. We are the ones who've got too little an appetite for satisfaction. We are satisfied with mud in comparison to what's on offer through Jesus. So here's what Jesus wants for each of us this morning, regardless of who we are or what we've believed all our lives or where we come from or what we've done. This is what Jesus wants for us from Isaiah 55 verses one and two. Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters and he who has no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Come to him. He will take care of the rest. He will take care of you. That is good news for someone like me who is not naturally glad in God. I am not naturally resting all my hopes for for satisfaction into his generous hands or on his shoulders. I love to tell people that all that's required of them is to just come to him because it's as simple as it gets. We can do that. Just ask Jesus to renew your soul today for the thousandth time or for the first time. And he will give you that joy and gladness that was his mission here on earth. That is what he wants for anyone who wants it, free of charge. Now, there's a hint here in the passage at how Israel fell into spiritual famine. Look at verse six with me. It says that the jars were for the Jewish rites of purification. Now, these weren't anything that God had commanded of his people, but the religious leaders at the time, they behaved that way. They were so over the top committed to the thing that they'd invented themselves, these Jewish rites of purification, that it puts the most kind of terrified, COVID conscious, um, sanitizing, regularly person from today, it puts them to shame. That's how obsessed they were with this kind of cleanliness. The guys, they'd essentially, the teachers of Israel, they had essentially replaced God's law. God's law was love your God wholeheartedly and love your neighbor as you love yourself. They'd replaced it with this exhaustive system of cleaning everything that you're, you're gonna touch or use as if that made you presentable before God, as if it cleansed you of your sin and made you right with a holy God. As laughable as that seems, we all have that kind of dreadful, doomed way of dreaming up how to make ourselves right with God sitting in our hearts. We've all got that ability. Jesus' sign is showing us that he came to replace that old, outdated way of thinking, that outdated system back then and today. He came to replace it with an infinitely superior way, so much the superior that it's like drinking the finest wine you've ever tasted versus every day of your life being water. That's how much better it is. One is for the highest point of life, the other is totally ordinary. There are our world religions today, just as back then, that believe that God is interested in how we clean ourselves and things like that, and how we wash ourselves or objects, ceremonial purification. They believe God will be impressed, but God has been absolutely clear in his word that the only way that we are gonna be clean and pure before him is through the blood of the new covenant, the blood of the Messiah, who by shedding his own blood rather than ours, sets us free. He makes us totally new. Funnily enough, Jesus, three years later, after the passage that we've just read at this wedding, 
He's at the Last Supper. And at the Last Supper, the night before he was to be murdered, he raised up a cup of wine and he said this, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. In shedding his blood, he made satisfaction for every moment that we've turned to something else for joy rather than to God, or invented something to make ourselves right with God rather than trusting in his only son. That's the moment that Jesus was looking forward to when he mentioned again in verse four, the hour of his that had yet to come. Incidentally, that's also the hour which reveals his glory the most. Glory is mentioned down in verse 11, the word R and the word glory are so intrinsically connected in this passage. You know that excitement whenever you go to see a play at a theater um, and it's a few minutes away from starting. Every little ripple of the curtain makes you really excited. You really want to get a glimpse at what's going on behind, even though you know it's going to open in a few minutes and you're going to see everything. At least I'm like that whenever I've seen a play. I don't know why. I hope everyone else is like that too. This first sign at a wedding in Cana is a little like Jesus giving a little ripple of the curtain before later on he shows his full-blown glory. His full-blown glory is shown in his death, his resurrection, and his ascension when he goes up to heaven and he reigns forever as our invincible representative. That's when the curtain gets torn back and his glory is shown fully. He is allowed to shine fully for who he is. So if you want in on this super abundant gladness, if you want to be purified, you have got to see the glory of Jesus. You've got to see the glory of Jesus at the cross. That's where the good news of Jesus rams home and it's free of charge. All we need to do is come to him and ask for it. Ask to see the glory of Jesus then Jesus promises that he will, he will give us sights of that glory. He will refine our spiritual taste buds and make us used to his superior wine. That's what the disciples got from the wedding at Cana, new spiritual taste buds. They believed in him, as verse 11 says, all the more as they saw his glory. I've just got a few brief comments to finish uh, this sermon off with. I said earlier that I'd explain uh, Jesus' slightly strange response to Mary. It's very help for us, helpful for us just to take uh, a couple of minutes to look at that. And it's especially helpful actually for our, our Roman Catholic friends and family, um, and also to kind of set aside any fears that we've got that Jesus is showing he's actually a misogynist at heart. Look back at verses four and five with me in our passage. Jesus said, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. First up, this isn't Jesus revealing that he's actually a misogynist at heart. If I said woman, you know, to my mom, I'd probably get a, a quick um, swift kick to the shins um, or something like that. Um, but the term that Jesus uses here in the original Greek, it's actually really respectful but it's also very formal and it creates a sense of distance between himself and his mother. And there's a reason that he does that. There's actually, I was reading a commentary this week to try and understand what the, the best modern word for, for the sense of what he's trying to say here gets across. And actually, funnily enough, the commentary said an Ulster Scots phrase, woman dear, is the best phrase that we've got to try and understand the tone of what Jesus is saying. I confess I've, I've never heard that phrase before in our wee country, but I've read that, found it very funny. It's very helpful for us. So it's respectful, but it's formal and it's distant. There's also an element, a really important element in it, of rebuke. Jesus is rebuking his mother here. And that does come across in the English. Why does he rebuke her? Because Mary has good intentions. She wanted to save the groom some embarrassment. The problem was though, she was coming to Jesus on the basis of having an inside track with him. She was coming to him on the basis that I'm the mother of Jesus. 
She had to learn a hard lesson here, that though she raised him, she carried him, she nursed him, and she'd even come to depend on him as the breadwinner because Joseph was likely uh, passed away at this point. He is the Lord of creation. He is the Lord of the new creation, even for her. That is who he primarily is, even for her. He is first and foremost the Lamb of God, even to her. She had to realize he was not primarily her son. He was primarily, first and foremost, even for her, her Lord and her Savior. So the Bible in no way teaches that we are to go to her as some kind of mediator between us and Jesus because she's got the inside track. Jesus is showing her here it's all a level playing field. We're all guilty of sin. We're all equally needy of the grace of Jesus for our salvation. She had to become totally dependent on God the Son for her own salvation. Now, Mary did learn this lesson. She humbled herself and responded to his rebuke in persevering faith. There's a pattern throughout the Gospels uh, that comes up occasionally when sometimes Jesus responds negatively. He rejects uh, a request for help whenever he would usually accept all of those requests for help. But sometimes he does that so that he can, he can draw out of someone persevering faith, so that he can get someone to show that even though he has, they, he has said no to them, they are going nowhere. They are clinging on to him because they know he is their only hope. When they show that they know, if, if Jesus won't help me, I've got nowhere else to go, so I'm just going to stay right here, and I'm going to ask again. That's how Mary responds to Jesus here. That's why her request is then granted. That's why Jesus um, performs this miracle. And that's maybe what you need to hear this morning as well, that you need to cling to Jesus, that you need to keep coming to him with the promises that he has given you in his word because he loves to answer that kind of faith that just keeps coming to him and saying, Lord, you've said this, please help. He loves to answer that kind of faith. Let me pray for us all. Heavenly Father, you are the glad God who has sent your son to bring about the renewal of all things. We need that, and so we ask for it in your abundant grace and your awesome power satisfy our thirst in you. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Our final hymn is a good song for also actually praying as we sing it to the Lord in praise. So let's get ready to end our time together by singing praise to God.
and give me Jesus in his cross my trust shall be and take this world and give me Jesus till that day And that's the end of our online service for this morning. If you'd like to talk about anything that you've heard today, um, you can easily just message our church Facebook page, the Marco Rally Presbyterian Church Facebook page, or you can contact our minister, Nigel, and he can even put you in touch with me if you'd like to chat about anything that you've heard today. To the end, let's say the benediction together wherever we're watching from. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.